Would you mind to confirm their blank screen? So it should be coming through right now. So what I have in mind is uh, the concentration of some quantity inside of a domain which I denote by U. And then uh, what I'd like to do next is I would like to look at the balance of this quantity inside of some reference domain V. So nu uh, denotes the unit normal. And so I would like to look at uh, the steady state of this quantity. So in the steady state, uh, I'm going to have the uh, no flux condition. So in order to compute the flux across the boundary. So across the boundary is accomplished by taking the flux density field with the normal vector, so the dot product, and integrating it across the boundary of this reference domain. So in the steady state, we assume that this quantity is zero, and we can apply the divergence theorem to this vector field and write the surface integral as the volume integral of the divergence of x, uh, divergence of f now across um, over the whole region v. So uh, what I have here is that for any domain, reference domain v, the diverge, the integral of the divergence is zero. So that allows me to say that the divergence of f is zero anywhere inside of this domains and I switch back to the slides. I have the uh, this equation that I just wrote down. So uh, this is one. Uh, so basically this is the conservation law that we can call this. Um, so in addition to the laws, uh, we also have the uh, constitutive relations. So uh, the constitutive relation comes in the form of either fixed law of diffusion if we're talking about uh, diffusion or the Fourier law of heat conduction, if we're talking about heat transfer. So in all of these situations, what we say is that the flux density is proportional to the gradient of the uh, density. Uh, so the gradient of U, uh, we have some constant of proportionality A, and the minus sign indicates that the quantity flows from the regions of high concentration to the regions of low concentration. And so when we put the two together, so the two being the divergence of F is equal to zero and F being the gradient of U with some constant. So what we get is the equation divergence of gradient of U is equal to zero. And this divergence of gradient is commonly denoted by the Laplacian delta. So we have our Laplace equation, uh, Laplace delta is equal to zero. So we can write out the Laplacian explicitly as the sum of second derivatives of u. So d to u dx one squared plus all the way to d to u dx n squared. Okay, so uh, when we solve uh, a Partial diff so this is a partial differential equation that we have on the bottom of this slide. So when we solve partial differential equations, we are concerned with uh, the well posedness, which consists of existence, uniqueness, and stability. So in order to achieve this, we need to supplement the equation with boundary conditions. So for that domain U that I wrote earlier on the slide, uh, we specify the values of the concentration of, on the boundary. So in the case of diffusion, we assume that the uh, uh, the region U sits in some sort of uh, you know medium in which the concentration on the boundary is prescribed. Uh, and so this is what the uh, concentration of the boundary as we come from the inside outside to the boundary is going to be. Um, another possibility is to specify the flux. So this is uh, the condition which corresponds to the Neumann boundary condition. So we say that the normal derivative, so this partial U partial nu denotes the normal derivative of U in the direction of the unit normal uh, outs pointing 
outside of the domain omega, and so this is uh, uh, this is another boundary condition. Uh, a combin sort of a combination of the two is the Robin boundary condition, where we have the uh, normal derivative of u minus constant times u is a prescribed value. So uh, in um, applications, this may be called an evaporation condition, and it basically says that the flux is proportional to the difference between the temperature, for example, um, inside or the concentration inside of the domain and outside of the domain. So for the first three bullets, um, the um, uh, the problem uh, can be characterized as a linear problem in the sense that if you take a linear combination of solutions, uh, so solutions to the whole problem, satisfying both the equation and the boundary condition, uh, then uh, you will have you will also have a solution, of course, you will need to, so for the homogeneous problem, for example, when f or g is equal to zero, so a linear combination of solutions is a solution. So same thing for the Robin boundary condition. So uh, this is in striking contrast to a problem proposed by a geophysicist, but uh, so also a mathematician, uh, George Backus. So he considered this problem in 1968, so what he asked was, can we find a harmonic function, so functions which satisfy the Laplace equation are called harmonic functions, can we find a harmonic function with the prescribed value of the modulus of the gradient on the boundary of the domain? And so in contrast to uh, the Dirichlet, Neumann, and Robin uh, problems, uh, the Backus problem is nonlinear. So if you take a linear combination of harmonic functions, uh, you, there's no way to guarantee uh, the uh, the magnitude of the gradient on the, on the boundary. So um, this uh, problem arises in geophysics. So uh, the uh, ge geologists are interested in describing the magnetic field of uh, the earth so we know that earth uh, consists primarily of uh, um, iron so this is the most abundant uh, element in uh, earth and this is also the source of the magnetic field and um, uh, the geologists are interested in you know describing this field inside of the Earth by observing the magnetic field on the surface. And uh, so for <coughs> measuring the magnetic field, so we will distinguish two types of devices. So these devices are going to be called magnetometers. And uh, so we will distinguish scalar magnetometers, which measure the magnitude or the total strength of the magnetic field and it, they basically uh, cannot detect the orientation. So uh, the examples of these devices are proton precession magnetometers, cesium, cesium vapor, helium magnetometers, and those devices are uh, very accurate. So the uh, precision is within 0.01 nano Tesla. Uh, and uh, they are, uh, sort of um, more manageable, like in the field, for example. So this is to be contrasted with a vector mag magnetometers, which uh, capture the whole magnetic field, uh, both the magnitude and the orientation, uh, again, uh, referenced against some uh, uh, field. So these devices need to be calibrated. Uh, so some examples are flux gate magnetometers, uh, squids or superconducting quantum interface devices, and then the uh, more recently introduced uh, spin exchange relaxation free atomic magnetometers. So, the disadvantage of the vector magnetometers, like the squid device, is that they're bulky and um, they uh, 
require maintenance. They're expensive. So if you have ever been in, in an MRI machine, so you know uh, the scale uh, of these devices. And uh, so uh, these uh, devices, so uh, the MRI machine is going to be an example of uh, the application in uh, in medicine. So I have another application. So if I can share the screen with this picture. So this is the uh, uh, an illustration from a paper on magnetoencephalography. That's another um, uh, imaging technique of uh, reading the magnetic field of the brain. Uh, so this is also a big device usually based on squids. And so what I find amazing in this paper is that uh, they uh, need, they feel the need to clarify, uh, I'll read the caption here, during an actual measurement, the instrument is of course in a helium dewar and the brain is inside the skull, exclamation mark. So uh, basically this is uh, done. So a patient just goes into a chamber, they put a big dewar uh, on top of their head. And uh, so similar, I guess, to the MRI device. So let me switch back to my slides. And uh, all right. So, uh, so let me formulate uh, the Bacchus problem, like I said, it's nonlinear, but uh, so the question is to determine a harmonic function u in region omega uh, from the gradient, the magnitude of the gradient of u on the boundary of the domain. And so Bacchus distinguished uh, three types of domains, the interior domain, the interior problem, which uh, refers to a bounded domain, the exterior problem, is uh, related to um, geomagnetism. Uh, so we would like to determine the field uh, in the exterior of a bounded domain, provided some conditions are met, like the field decays at infinity or and half plane, just, I guess, for the ease of you know, calculation. So um, the, uh, there are some results which are in, in Bacchus paper and so in particular, he uh, established existence and uniqueness uh, for two dimensional domains. So in order to have uh, these two, uh, so well posedness, uh, basically we need to specify where the zeros of uh, the uh, function are. So these are the points Z, Z, Z1 through Zn that we need to specify in the domain. So if we prescribe the zeros of the function u, and uh, there's also non-uniqueness due to the phase shift. So uh, if we also prescribe the direction of the gradient of u at just one point, then uh, we can say there exists a unique uh, harmonic function with these properties that it vanishes at z1 through zn, and its, its direction coincides with that at uh, z0. But um, Bacchus also pointed out that uh, he was not able to obtain any existence or uniqueness results for higher dimensions. So it's in, in particular for the interior problem. And uh, so uh, there are some conditions under which uniqueness can be established. So that's only uniqueness and there's nothing about existence or reconstruction. So one condition is that if the field uh, on the boundary is non-tangential. So in particular, if the uh, normal derivative is strictly positive or sign definite for that matter, or strictly negative, we can flip the sign uh, on U and change the sign. But as long as it's uh, uh, sign definite, then we have existence. Uh, sorry, then we have uniqueness. Uh, then some other examples, I guess, coming from uh, the techniques used in uh, geosciences, if the U is a finite sum of exterior spherical harmonics. So this comes from the decomposition of uh, a function uh, using uh, the separation of variables technique. So if uh, the if U is a finite sum, then uh, 
we can determine uh, the gradient, uh, the, the function u with the prescribed magnitude of the gradient. And uh, another condition is that if we know the, uh, the magnitude of the gradient in all of the domain, uh, exterior domain omega, then the uniqueness is guaranteed. Uh, but uh, a couple of years later, uh, same author Bacchus gave an example uh, of non-uniqueness. So he basically came up with two, so two solutions to uh, the uh, special domain, the exterior of a sphere in R3. And uh, so basically by looking at um, expansions of uh, the solution, he was able to uh, come up with conditions on some coefficients, but other coefficients were undetermined. So uh, this gave rise to two, well, at least two functions for which um, neither their sum nor the difference uh, uh, was zero outside of the domain, outside of the sphere. All right, some uh, other uh, exam uh, results in this direction is to Jorge and Magnanini. So uh, they uh, considered the uh, problem also on the sphere and uh, they considered this domain where the normal derivative of uh, the function is zero. So this is um, in some sense can be referred as the magnetic equator. So if we can guarantee for two functions that their values match on this magnetic equa equator and uh, the magnitude of the gradients match on the whole of the boundary. So if uh, these two functions are harmonic, then we can guarantee uniqueness uh, under these conditions. And uh, some further results, um, a little bit more recent. Uh, so Diaz, Diaz and Otero consider the exterior Bacchus problem <coughs> and they transformed it into an interior problem by Kelvin transform. So this transform gave rise to this nonlinear boundary condition. So this is uh, similar to the Robin boundary condition that I had before, but on the right hand side, we have the tangential gradient of u appearing in this nonlinear expression here. So they were able to show this, the existence of viscosity solution. So this problem is, uh, is not well posed. So to mollify it, uh, they introduced the parameter epsilon inside of the uh, square root here, and they were able to show that the uh, mollified problem has a solution. So uh, going in the other direction, so in Bacchus problem, the magnitude of the gradient is prescribed, but the um, the direction is unknown. So we can turn it around, or actually Kaiser turned it around and looked at the problem where the direction of the field was known on the boundary, but the magnitude was unknown. So uh, this problem is uh, linear, actually. And uh, so he was uh, looking at the space of solutions. So uh, in particular, he characterized the dimensions. So there's some parameters at play. So this is this is all for the exterior problem. And we need to specify the rate of decay of the solution. So B stands for the field, or in this case is going to be the gradient of U. So for the choice, so the reasonable choice of parameters delta. Uh, so he was, and also, Another parameter is the rotation number rho of the field D. So uh, the two cases that uh, his techniques are um, able to handle is the two-dimensional case. So in this case, he has the formula for the dimension of the space of solutions. And uh, in R3, he considered the axisymmetric case. And in this case, it's only an upper bound on the space of solutions. OK, so uh, what we saw is that so in order to state this problem uh, to in order to have any hope for well posedness, we need to su supplement the boundary data, uh, the uh, the back boundary data, the magnitude of the 
gradient with something like in Becca's case, it was the values of the so the location of all the zeros inside of the domain or uh, the fact that uh, you have the values on uh, some uh, in some region like the uh, the uh, magnetic equator on on the sphere. So uh, what we propose is to supplement the um, the boundary values with the normal derivative of the magnitude of the gradient. And this is the second formula, the second uh, condition in this formula one, two. Unfortunately, I cannot hi highlight it. Uh, but uh, so the problem that um, we propose to consider is given the values of the magnitude of the gradient P and the value of the normal derivative of the magnitude of the gradient. That's a mouthful. We want to determine whether there exists a unique harmonic function uh, which satisfies uh, these two conditions. And uh, <coughs> uh, in general, we expect that uh, P and Q, the values of P and Q need to be in some sense connected. So we would like to find conditions on these functions which guarantee existence and uniqueness. So uh, this is the, the problem that is uh, referenced in the title of the talk. So that's the back problem with expanded data. And uh, just to give you some motivation why uh, we would want to consider uh, a function like this. So um, I have uh, an example from uh, so this is a three dimensional so example from three dimensions. So I have here two harmonic functions. So one is a polynomial and I'm calling this this U zero. So the uh, idea is that we I, I'd like to refer to this U zero as the background field. So the magnitude is um, like of order one and uh, on top of it, I want to superimpose a uh, a disturbance or perturbation, so which will I, I will call U1. So U1 is the uh, fundamental solution of Laplace equation, which I denote by gamma. And uh, so this is a solution which has a singularity at zero. So you see that I have one over square root of X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared in the denominator. So uh, this is a solution that blows up, so it's not defined as zero. Here I shifted to the point x1, y1, z1. And so I have these specific values for <coughs> the um, x0 in this line and uh, x1, y1, z1. And then so I look at the so the third function that I look at is the sum of these two. So that's the background field plus the um, plus the perturbation. So I'll switch to the slide where I have all these uh, functions plotted. So this is uh, so OK, I don't have this slide anymore on the screen, but basically uh, what I refer to is what, what I uh, am constructing is a harmonic function in R3. So the boundary um, of the domain is, I suppose, is contains the unit square in the x y plane, and so here I have the plots of the function. So in the top row, I have the plot of the function u zero, u one, and their sum. So uh, you know what to look at here, and I hope you can see this uh, on the screen. I hope it's large enough. Is that the um, the scale of U naught is from 2 to 12, so it's of order like 1 or 10. If we look at the perturbation, it goes from negative 0.15 to uh, negative 0.07. And then for the sum, uh, of course, this is uh, the U naught is going to dominate, and we have the scale from 0 to from 2 to 12 here. So again, of order I guess 1 or 10. Now, when we look at the data in the Bacchus problem, so what we see is that in the uh, background field, uh, well, there's uh, nothing interesting here. So for D zero, for, so D here stands for the gradient, all right? So 
for the so I switched the notation a little bit, but uh, when we look at the um, the magnitude of the gradient, it's not that much different from U naught. When we look at the magnitude of the gradient of the perturbation, we see this uh, like hot spot, and this is coming from the um, the source. So this is the one over square root of x one being uh, somewhere near this region, and so we have. Uh, uh, this uh, um, feature in, in the graph of the magnitude of the gradient. So when we look at the magnitude of the gradient of the sum, again, the scale is going to come from the scale of the magnitude of the gradient of U naught. So here it goes from, so it's of order 100. So the scale here is of order 100, but the feature uh, that we have on the magnitude of the gradient of uh, U1 is not preserved in the, in the magnitude of the gradient of the sum. But if we look at the uh, normal derivative, so what we see is, so actually this is, uh, I think, a constant here for the, uh, for the function U0. So again, we see this feature uh, in the graph uh, of the uh, normal derivative of the magnitude of the gradient. And uh, so uh, what I want to point out is this, last uh, uh, picture, so the last cartoon or graph um, has both the features of the background field. So the uh, magnitude here is, so the scale is of order 100, but this graph also preserves this feature of the, uh, the hot spot that we did not see in the magnitude of the gradient on the previous line. So let me switch back to the slides and I need to okay go here and uh, so another uh, advantage sort of of looking at this expanded data is the connection to the inverse source problem so this is the problem where we look at the uh, so here we can call this the Poisson equation. That's the Laplace, the non-homogeneous Laplace equation, and we look at it uh, with the special right-hand side, which is the uh, the sum of uh, essentially the um, derivatives of the um, the fundamental solution. So uh, this is what we refer to as the sources, and uh, so with the data. Um, that we take, namely the magnitude of the gradient and the normal derivative, derivative of this magnitude of the gradient, we can put it together into an expression which gives us an estimate on the number of sources. So, um, you know, to get some appreciation, so uh, the in the standard inverse source problem, so maybe I have it on the slide, is uh, we are looking to recover the field, in particular the locations and the moments of the sources given the potential, the function u and its normal derivative on the boundary. So uh, this problem requires some work in order to just establish this number of um, say monopoles or dipoles, these are the special looked at most often, but um, in our case we have with the data in this form, we have an estimate on the number of um, the sources, although it's an estimate from below, but uh, still this is, uh, you know, some indication of what the, um, the source is uh, supposed to look like. And uh, so um, what I want to do next is I want to switch back to the, sl um, to the screen where I can draw. And uh, so I basically want to derive the ODE system in the special in the simple case um, uh, of a of a straight boundary. So I think I'm sharing now. So what I have here is the um, so let me denote so the equation that we have so Laplace U. Uh, this is uxx plus uyy in, is equal to zero. So this is in R2. So 
So I'm not sure how to get rid of this. All right. And um, the data that we uh, are considering is the magnitude of the gradient. So let me look at the square of the magnitude of the gradient. And so what I would like to do with it is I would like to take its partial derivative. So, um, so the domain here is the upper half plane. All right. And so the direction in the X, so the um, derivative in the X direction is just a tangential uh, derivative. So this is given from P. So uh, what is different is the derivative and the normal derivative. Uh, so this is co this corresponds to the der derivative of P with respect to Y. So let me take these derivatives here. So PX is 2 UX UXX plus UY UXY. And the derivative with respect to Y is 2 UX UXY plus UY UYY. And what I would like to do with this is I would like to put them into linear combination. So if I multiply the first equation for PX by UX and I multiply the second equation for PY by UY and take the difference. So what happens is I can cancel some terms. So the terms that will cancel are going to be the term here and the term here. So I multiply the first uh, blue term by UX and the second term by UY. When I take the difference, they go away. And um, for the um, term here, what I have is that I have the equation. So UXX is equal to UYY. So this uh, can be written as a single term. So two, so I can bring this outside UXX and what I have inside is UX squared plus UY squared. And I recognize this is actually P, what I have in parentheses, UXX. And then the, uh, the second equation out of these two is I multiply PX by UY and I multiply PY by UX. So what happens here is that I will now cancel these terms again by the uh, Laplace equation. And I can combine the uh, the other terms into so I have two UY squared plus UX squared UXY. Uh, so again, this is 2PUXY. And so now I turn around and introduce variables. So if I call UXZ1 and UYZ2, then I can write this system of equations as a system of ODEs. So I have Z1, Z2 dot. So the dots really correspond to the derivative with respect to X. And then in the matrix form, I have PX minus PY, PY, PX, then Z1, Z2. All right, so this is a homogeneous system uh, of ODs, and I have two of them. So, uh, oh, this sorry, is... can I have a question? Yeah. Uh, so, in your first equation, so like px ux minus, minus py ui, so where is uy y? I think yeah, you still so have uy y. So, uy y, you're referring to this uy y actually yeah. is. Oh, negative minus UXX. UXX. And since I have the minus here, I can just combine it with this UXX and it's here actually. I see, I see. That reason you had good minus. Okay, I see. Right. Thanks. Thank I'm you. I'm glad someone is checking. <laughs> so let me go back to my slides. And uh, we basically do the same thing 
for um, a, an arbitrary domain, obviously we need to uh, ensure that we can take tangential and normal derivatives. So we assume that the domain is smooth. So we take a function uh, which is twice continuously differentiable. So tau denotes the unit tangent vector, nu is the unit normal vector. So let's consider parametrization of the boundary by arc length, and let's call this function gamma or in uh, coordinates x of t, y of t. And uh, so uh, again, denoting z1 or u tau by z1 and u nu by z2. So we now have the representation of Z1 and Z2 in terms of the partial derivatives of U and uh, the parameters uh, X and Y or its uh, derivatives. And uh, so once we go through this same calculation that I did uh, on, the, um, on the previous screen, uh, so we can write this as a system for Z dot, so Z being a vector with two components. And uh, so at this point, we can write this as a non-homogeneous system, but uh, the parameters or the components of the matrix uh, for the homogeneous part are the same. So this highlighted term is essentially P sub tau. This, the highlighted term below it is P sub nu. And uh, so we have some expression beta, which depends on ux and uy but using the fact that we have the arc length parameterization, we can actually rewrite this non-homogeneous system as a homogeneous system. So we just need to update the component A2 appearing here. And so this is essentially using the fact that we have the arc length parameterization that allows us to write the uh, system as a homogeneous system. And uh, so I actually have the solution on the next slide. So this can be written in the complex form. So this is fairly elementary. So we actually have explicit solutions for Z1 and Z2 given as the cosine of the integral of the component A2, the integration of the e to the power uh, A1 gives us the square root of P, uh, so this is the common component uh, for both Z1 and Z2. So uh, this is an explicit solution. And uh, so uh, we can pat ourselves on the back and said we were done. But uh, now the question is, does what we find correspond to the solution of the original Bacchus problem? And there are some features to um, keep in mind. So. Uh, Z1 comes from the ta tangential derivative of U. So when we integrate Z1, we're supposed to get zero. So if we don't get zero, this is an, an indication that something is wrong. Same thing for Z2, which is U tau. So if the function is harmonic, then the divergence theorem is supposed to give us the integral of Z2 is equal to zero. And uh, well, actually, for this um, ODE system, we can actually show that uh, if the data is periodic, so the data is in the form of A1 and A2, not periodic, but uh, they, well, first of all, they need to be periodic, of course, but they also need to have the features that A1 integrates to zero and A2 integrates to an integer multiple of two pi. So if, if so these equations will be you know, more or less satisfied from the structure of this ODE. But then uh, the question is, does this correspond to a solution of the original Bacchus problem? And uh, so uh, this leads us to this idea of, the, of using the Hilbert. So uh, I'll uh, introduce it in a couple of slides. And obviously, I can see that I cannot go through all of the slides, but I would like to finish the two-dimensional uh, part and maybe just allude to what we have for the three-dimensional case. So uh, to motivate the Hilbert transform, I'm going to look, and again, this is elementary material for uh, 
you know, which you will see in elementary PDE class, undergraduate PDE. So we, all right. So when we look at the problems, the Laplace equation on the half plane with the supplemented with the Dirichlet boundary condition, we actually have a formula for the solution, which is called the Poisson formula. So this is for the half plane. And uh, so X1 and X2 are now the components on the plane and I'm using Y for the variable of integration. So actually this Y uh, is a point on the, um, on the horizontal, so on the X axis, on the horizontal X, well, I shouldn't call it X, so X1 axis. And uh, so Y has the coordinates Z, uh, Y1 comma zero. So this formula gives us the solution explicitly. And uh, so what we show in the PDE course is that uh, this uh, formula, so this, when we uh, send Y X2 to zero, this will give us precisely the value G, uh, the uh, prescribed boundary value. So um, if we take, so coming from our ODE, we have the function Z1, Z1, which corresponds to the tangential derivative. So in order to recover the value of the function, we need to integrate the tangential derivative. And assuming some DK properties, uh, let's say the uh, solution decays to zero. So if we integrate from negative infinity, to y1, we're supposed to recover u. And so now we want to connect z1 and z2. So z2 is the normal derivative. So that corresponds to the derivative with respect to x2. So uh, we cannot take the derivative of this function, you know, right on the boundary, but we can look at the limit uh, as x2 goes to zero from above. So uh, when you do the calculation, so what we will have is this expression for the normal derivative. And this is an integral of Z1. Uh, so one thing to notice is, again, you cannot integrate this on the boundary in earnest because this behaves as like 1 over X. So we need to make sense out of this quotient as we pass to the limit as X2 goes to 0. So uh, there's a similar formula for the solution of the Neumann problem, so the Neumann data being H, we have a Denis formula for the half plane. And uh, so this is uh, going to be the integral of the HY con sort of convolved with the fundamental solution in R2. So this log X minus Y is a special function uh, for harmonic, uh, uh, for the potential theory. So we again do the same thing. We want to connect the Z2 with Z1, so in this case, H is Z2. Uh, so when we compute V by this formula, we would like to have the tangential derivative matching Z1. And so when I take the tangential derivative, so again, in the limit as X2 goes to zero, I can compute this integral when Y2 is not, X2 is not zero. Uh, but when it is, we need to make sense out of this. So I have two expressions and um, I'll put them both on the same slide. So I'll repeat what I had on previous slides. So uh, when we take Z1 and solve the Laplace, uh, the Laplace equation with the Dirichlet boundary condition and take the normal derivative, we have an expression uh, in the first line after the equations. Uh, when we do the same thing, we take Z2 and um, solve the uh, Laplace equation with the Neumann boundary condition, take the tangential derivative. So notice how similar these expressions are. So the difference is essentially in the sign and Z1 is interchanged with Z2. So this leads us to the notion of Hilbert transform. So this is um, the transform of a function f uh, obtained by integrating f against 1 over x minus y. So in this case now x and y are both uh, points on the, uh, on, the, on the real line, in the real line. And uh, so as written, this integral is not defined. So to make sense out of this, of this uh, we um, 
define this integral in the principal value sense. So we essentially look at the limit as um, some parameter epsilon goes to zero and we integrate uh, this integral, this function outside of the integral interval of length two epsilon around the origin or around the point X. And uh, so this uh, is a powerful notion uh, which allows us to connect uh, the um, solutions of uh, the two equations that we had. And so to generalize this notion, uh, we'll just introduce this uh, concept of the generalized Hilbert transform. So we essentially define the Hilbert transform by integrating the function on the boundary. So the integrating the given function f on the boundary and solving the corresponding Dirichlet problem. Now, once we solve the problem U, we take the normal derivative, and this is what we call the, the generalized Hilbert transform. So with, the, um, with this notion introduced, I can now state the theorem. So let me recall the system of ODEs that we derived. So assuming some regularity condition on the data, so this is the P and Q, uh, so we know how to solve the ODE system, so we'll denote by Z the solution of the ODE system. Uh, we uh, assume some scaling so to the data, uh, which is uh, easily obtained. And uh, the condition for uh, the solution of the Backus problem to exist is that Z1 is minus is the Hilbert transform of Z1 is minus Z2. And uh, for the Hilbert transform, there's the symmetric connection. So if you take the Hilbert transform, um, uh, again, you will basically uh, pick up the minus sign. So H of Z2 is equal to Z1. So this is the manifestation that the Hilbert transform maintains the magnitude uh, or amplitude uh, but rotates the phase by uh, pi over 2. So if we have this uh, connection between Z1 and Z2 through Hilbert transform, then there exists a unique solution uh, to, the, um, to the expanded Backus problem. And uh, so this is what I wanted to say about the two-dimensional case. But let me just uh, quickly say, uh, Dr. Dean, do I have another five minutes? Oh, yes. yes. OK, so let me just briefly touch upon what uh, technique we have for the three dimensional case. So the difference here is that the OD techniques do not work as well. And uh, so uh, what we have here, so let me uh, start with uh, the space Rn plus 1 plus, so that's the upper half plane in the n plus 1 dimensional space. So uh, we're interested in finding a function which is harmonic in this space Rn plus 1 plus. So I'll introduce the full gradient, so the uh, square of the magnitude of the full gradient in this line. And I'll take the normal derivative. So normal will be the derivative with respect to x n plus 1. So here again, I uh, loosely use the notation. So capital D n plus 1 denotes the normal derivative with respect to x n plus 1. And so uh, what we have in this case, so using these two equations and the Laplace equation, we uh, we derive the equation satisfied by u, but now on the boundary of Rn plus 1. So with this, which will be just the space Rn. And um, the uh, equation that I have here is uh, ugly. <laughs> so this will probably take another hour to discuss the features of this equation. Uh, so we are not able to solve it yet. There's there's some progress and there's some features that we can describe about this equation. So maybe to jump ahead, I can uh, skip to this slide. And uh, the um, uh, feature that we usually look at uh, for this equation, so let me 
point this equation here. So this is a second order equation. So I have the gradient in the numerator. Uh, there's also the gradient in uh, in the denominator, uh, but I'll treat this sort of separately. Same thing for the uh, lower order term. There's the gradient here, and then we have the divergence outside. So this is a second order equation, and we hope so we would like to think that it's an elliptic equation, and it is. So this is a regularized problem. So when we take epsilon to be zero, we can ignore this. So what we have here is that this uh, uh, the eigenvalues, so which are denoted by C and zeta, are non-zero. But we have problem when the uh, gradient is tangential to the boundary and in this case the eigenvalues are zero so in order to deal with this we regularize the equation or the operator and we introduce some parameter epsilon which is supposed to uh, smooth things out and so for this regularized equation so at this point i'm going to jump to the last slide and here what we can say is that uh, we establish uh, bound on u epsilon in the holder C1 beta space. And so this bound plays into the liray shouter theory, which allows us to say that the, um, uh, the solution of the regularized problem with some conditions on the boundary and uh, the condition on the uh, boundary function uh, we can establish that there exists a solution to the Dirichlet problem. Uh, and uh, I think I'm out of time, so I'm going to stop here. And I'll... Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Pata. Uh, do you have any questions for our speaker? I think that the, the talk was very interesting at the beginning, like, you know, with different <laughs> applications. <laughs> uh, so uh, like in, in your last slide, you have, uh, I think you can have some uh, reality uh, estimate for U epsilon for the solution, right? U yes, epsilon. right. And, and uh, your plan is to send epsilon to zero. That's right, yes. Uh, but so far, I think what you have is your solution is bounded. So maybe you can get some kind of conversion, but uh, so 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 what, what what is the difficulty after that? So the difficulty, and um, I have it on the sl slide here. So just to kind of show the whole program for the uh, Liray shouter estimates is there's a, a four stage process. So we mm -hmm. estimate. The function, so the uh, the the supremum of the function. Then, using the supremum of the function in the domain, we estimate the gradient on the boundary. Using the gradient on the boundary and the supremum of the function, we estimate the gradient inside of the domain, and then we uh, bootstrap it to the uh, one beta norm. So, uh, what we have is that on in these three steps, we can have a uniform uh, a bound which is uniform in epsilon, but unfortunately in this step we cannot get around the uh, the bound blowing up. So the uh, the passing to the limit is not going to work because we don't have a uniform estimate. So mm -hmm. the estimate depends on epsilon and it blows up. But thank you for your question. That's uh, uh, <laughs> this. Uh, uh, this goes to the uh, to the bottom of the problem that so we have. Yeah. It, it is the is this kind of argument similar to the the blow up analysis? So blow up uh, in the sense of the solution. So I'm yeah, yes. Yeah, so they they send they send the they send epsilon to zero. Uh, So actually, we would like to the solution not to blow up. So this is uh, right, right. So that's really a point. So, uh, so for for example, um, 
your solution is continuous, right? So um, suppose uh, the, the maximum point of your solution is uh, x epsilon, for example, then do you refer that, that x epsilon there convert to a point inside the domain or on the boundary? Uh, so you, you, I mean, you mean the well, it, well? Are the boundary conditions satisfied? Is that what you're asking? And I, I mean, um, yeah. So, but 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 yes, because usually when I use the flow analysis, uh -huh. then I, I I concern the maximum point of the, the solution, mm -hmm. and I consider two cases: is it in the boundary or on the boundary inside the domain or on the boundary? But I don't know if the, the argument you you use here is the same or not. Yeah, so I, I, we have a uniform bound on, on boundary, okay, on on the supremum of the function. So the, uh, you know, the the supremum of the solution is handled in just one sweep. But um, so this is the maximum and comparison principles that yeah, yes. we can use. Um, but the problem is in the later stages when we try to estimate the holder normal norm of the gradient. So that's yeah. where things are not clear. So my, I guess my my next question is, what what is why why do we have a huge difference between two dimensions and three dimensions? What is the main reason? Um, so this is a I guess a fundamental question. So, yeah. Um, well, I mean, the technical question is that in 2D we can convert to OD, and uh, there's no such thing in in oh, R3. So, I mean, so, there's like if it was, you know, first order, you can hope for some sort of, uh, you know, character method of characteristics. But this is, a, you know, this is second order equation. So uh, perhaps this is the, you know, a, a, an explanation for this. I see. I see. So, so you mean we can prove that there is no such uh, transformation to change you know, the problem to ODA in 3D, right? Yeah. So there's no such technique available, and I, oh, okay. I, yeah, I should say I have tried. So there's, uh, uh, so I have a like ma maple code to try to, uh, you know, massage the equations that I wrote on on the iPad. So just to uh, Kind of, you know, derive them by brute force, and uh, it turns out in 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 three D there is no solution. So uh, mm -hmm. this technique just doesn't work, and it's uh, it's quite uh, involved. Like this is a like a hundred variable system. So I really needed to use Maple to uh, you know verify that there's no solution. I see. Okay. All right. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Lam, for interesting conversation. Uh, do you have anything else for uh, our speaker? So I want to thank everyone for joining. Yeah, thank you again, uh, Dr. Cloto, for interesting talk, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, so if you don't have anything else, so let's thank again, right, the speaker. <laughs> thank you very okay. much. Great talk. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, next week we have talk uh, delivered by Dr. Kong Chen Le from uh, Guinyang University, Vietnam. Uh, I will send out. Uh, I actually already quite a meeting, but I will send out an announcement about that. And uh, thank you again, and see you next week. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, Bye, thank everybody. you. Bye everybody. Thank you. Bye everybody. Thank you. Have a nice day.